All right. Um, let's start with a couple of announcements. Well, I guess one announcement only. Uh, the homework assignment that's having to do with uh, today's material is due a week from today, on November 6th. And uh, what we're going to do is continue talking about the NRCS method. And um, we're going to do a few demos. I hope you got my email that if you wanted to bring your computer today, you could follow along. If not, watching is perfectly fine. Um, Essentially, what we're going to do is explore some of the data sets that we'll utilize in more of an automatic way when we uh, start using the WMS software. I think it's important to see where you could actually download it yourself and who's operating the data set and what is it generated based on. So that's what we'll be doing with this geospatial data demo. And we'll, we'll be doing it as we also talk about the unit hydrograph and time of concentration. So the NR, NRCS method so far, that formula that uses curve number to define storage and precipitation excess to, uh, is, the, is the point, precipitation excess. What were the units of that NRCS method that you've done so far? Inches, right. So it told you how much precipitation excess there's going to be based on how much precipitation. Remember, in hydrology, the timing of it is often just as significant, if not more important, than uh, the overall amount. And so the unit hydrograph and time of concentration aspects of the NR NRCS method kind of uh, defines that. So the first step was to find out how much runoff there will be. And then what we'll be talking about today is the method that's used to, uh, to specify when it hits. OK, so before we get into that, um, I wanted to uh, point out the link for Google Earth Pro. Now, it's mainly just a tool for visualizing data and you know, opening up uh, GIS data if you don't have something more sophisticated like ArcMap uh, made by Esri. Um, but you can do some basic calculations with it. You can measure areas. Um, you can trace the perimeter of a watershed. And um, so let's first of all do that. Let me show you uh, why I said that enabling and disabling the terrain can be useful in Google Earth Pro. If we zoom in on the tri-state area, here now where you see Cabell County, the outline of Cabell County. And I know the area north of 60 between Barbersville and Milton pretty well. So as you're continuing to zoom in, on my mouse, there's this center button. And if I press it down, if I hold it down, and then I move the mouse down, what it begins to do is it begins to tilt the view. And I think that can also be accomplished uh, with this. I'm com no, that's just panning. And that's zooming in and out. I guess maybe you have to use the, the cursor. So, pressing in on the center wheel and then panning down. And so with that, what you can do is now you can, since the terrain is turned on, if you turn off the terrain, it becomes flat again and you lose this ability. But with the terrain turned on, um, in the background is an elevation model. It's called the digital elevation model. And so it's draping that aerial photo. It's draping the imagery over the digital elevation model. And you can get a sense for the 3D nature of these as you pan around. It's really with the motion that it kind of becomes clear. And so here you can see there's a little hollow where if it rains, we could see that raindrops are going to face a decision point with this ridge line. And raindrops that fall to the left of that ridge line are going to go in a different hollow. And so there is going to be a certain amount of water coming out of this area. And one of the things that we need to know is the contributing area. You know, if, if there is, and it looks like there is, a roadway here, and we wanted to find out how much water is going to be coming out of here, because maybe it has to pass through a culvert so that it can get in the creek that's on the other side of the road. So one of the tools that Google Earth has is a measure area tool. And you can kind of just manually sketch out that ridge line 
Uh, here, if we have this add polygon button across the top, let's try and trace this ridge line. Now, let's make sure that we understand where it is. So think about the water that falls here is just going to go down. We want to find out what's concentrating to this point, you know, the, the contributing area for this point. So it's going to obviously be limited by the top of this ridge line. We could follow it around over here, this ridge line, and across there. And by the way, if you're trying to find the exact same spot as me, let me point out at the bottom is the lat long. So here's the latitude and the longitude. So this happens to be where the hand is, uh, 38 degrees, 27 minutes, 3.84 seconds north. 82 degrees, 12 minutes, 03.21 degrees west. Uh, maybe that's not as useful as just zooming out again and showing you. If you can see the raceway, everybody knows the Ona Speedway. I live several miles away, and I can still hear them driving around on a Saturday night. Really loud cars. Fast cars, but not so good on the mufflers, I think. Um, so let's zoom in. Oh, what, no, did I lose it? Where was it? Was it, it was this one. All right. So just over by the airport. Now, to define that, to delineate that watershed, we'd have to kind of do it manually. So I'm going to add a polygon where I'm just clicking on the borders of where I think the limits of rain falling might be. Yeah, let me move this out of the way here. All right. So it's maybe approximately. Now here, uh, under measurements, it'll tell you both the perimeter and the area. Now, 0, 0.0 square miles because it's a relatively small watershed. But if, I bet if we switch it over to acres, OK, 23 acres. And perimeter maybe isn't so useful in miles, but if I was to walk that perimeter 37, 10 feet, that'd be a pretty good walk, especially since it's hilly. OK. so. That's the easy way to delineate a watershed. Maybe another way to put it would be it's the crude way, because it was all just approximation. But a computer can do the same thing that I just did visually and kind of by instinct. Because there's this digital elevation model in the background, what it is is um, there's a variety of methods, including LIDAR, where a plane would fly over, and they're using uh, radar to uh, penetrate down through the canopy and find out where's the ground surface. And they'll take measurements at maybe three, de three meter increments. And so every three meters, they are finding out the elevation. And that's three meters by three meters. And so it's uh, like a mesh where the elevation is known at every spot. And so what a computer can do is it can compare the elevation of one mesh to the elevation of all of its surrounding meshes and then find out what way a water droplet would flow based on you know, water fl flowing downhill. So if a raindrop hits a certain mesh element, it's going to go from there. The next direction it's going to go is to whichever of the other meshes is lowest. And so by comparing in a broad area uh, all of those dependencies of what's a higher elevation than what and what's the adjacency, it can identify where a stream is likely to form, and it can also find the extent or the limits of a watershed. So we will do that uh, once we begin working with WMS. But I like playing around with Google Earth Pro just because it's an easy way to visualize the topography. Another nice feature of Google, or Google Earth Pro, besides visualizing the terrain and measuring the area, is you can import something called a shapefile. How many people here have taken a GIS class or already are familiar with shapefiles? So just one. Um, shapefiles are becoming less common than they used to be. It used to be kind of the default way of communicating GIS data. Uh, but they're still out there. And you'll find shapefiles on the USDA website of soil type. And you're actually going to have to use a shapefile in a homework assignment that I put on MU Online. It's in a zip archive. And that's how the USDA website will read the shapefile. But let me show you how you can open a shapefile directly. Um, I think I have one on my V drive. And if not, we can come back to it. Uh, OK. 
area of interest shapefile. Let me unzip that. So you can see that the um, it's hiding the extension. Oh, SHP. This is the one that I'm going to open up. And uh, it's just essentially like how I was drawing a little area. It's the same thing. So file, import, and among the file types that you can import using Google Earth, there's a lot of them, um, is .shp, an Esri shapefile. And so now I'll browse to that same location where I just unzipped the area of interest shapefile. And there it is, that .shp. And uh, I don't necessarily want it to be a certain style, style template. That means I could shade it or make it a certain color. And if I turn it on, there's the area of interest. And so it's a way of specifying a boundary where, like, if I upload that shapefile to a website, then it would know what area it should report the elevations for. It would know what area I need it to give me the soil type data back for, and so on. Yeah. So what's the difference between the file and shapefile? Because I know, like, you can convert shapefile to a KMZ file and then upload it to. Yeah. KMZ files are open source, whereas I think .shp is proprietary to Esri. And so when things are encoded in certain formats, I think royalties have to be paid. And so the way that KMZ and KML files were developed is because you know, Google and other companies didn't want to have to pay those royalties anymore. And so KMZ and KML is probably like an open exchange format that uh, is preferred. But a lot of the data, just because of historical precedent, was, has always been in shapefile. And that's what they had. But you can do a lot of the same things. There's nothing inherently unique about a shapefile. It's kind of like .txt or .csv, you know, for ex opening notepad data in Excel. All right. So uh, this, by the way, on the homework assignment, what you'll be uploading to the USDA website is the .zip file. Um, it, I guess, to save uh, space. You, know, you can see that zip file is only 5 kilobytes, but when it's unzipped, it's a whopping 67. <laughs> so the USDA website prefers that those shape files be uploaded as the archive. And so you've got the archive there. And I guess the other thing about the archive is that it has more than just the shape file. There are other things, uh, like the, the projection is defined in some of these auxiliary database files. All right, so um, Google Earth Pro, it's nice that it's free. I used to, in recent years uh, even, I had to fill out like a grant application with Google to get an academic license so all the students could install it. But I think it, about two or three years ago, they just decided to make it free and not charge any longer. Um, soil data is important. And remember that there are four soil classes that go into the NRCS method. You know, remember, soil class D are those plastic or saline soils where there's zero, um, uh, zero centimeters per day going through uh, due to gravity drainage. Uh, soils on the A scale are sandy and granular and have a much higher hydraulic conductivity. And so we can get that hydrologic soil group data from the USDA. And uh, the Department of Agriculture has an amazing array of responsibilities. The things that they have to do is really shocking, like how much is in the Department of Agriculture. And one of them is to develop soil maps for the entire country. And it kind of makes sense that if you're in the business of agriculture, you'd need to know what are the soil characteristics and try and prevent erosion. And so this web soil survey is a website that they put together so that you can get at the uh, data that they've got. So you can just type in web soil survey into Google, and it'll probably send you to the same spot that is coming up with the link here. So it begins with a map of the United States. And what we're going to do, wrong one. Uh, we're going to define an area of interest. So you can see uh, the area of interest that I had uh, 
identified in a previous, but let's just zoom in on West Virginia here in the tri-state. Uh, in fact, let's go with Charleston. So I guess it's the intersection of the highways will get us into Charleston. Up by the airport, let's see, I think the airport's up by, yeah, there it is, I see it up on the hill. See the airport? Let's pan over. All right. So uh, let's define our area of interest. And across the top here, you can define an area of interest either by laying down a triangle or a polygon. So I'm just going to uh, define my area of interest by clicking in the extents. Or you may have to click and drag. Yeah, all right. Click and drag to the extents. And so now it knows what I'm interested in. So it's created this area of interest. You can see it's shaded. And uh, we can browse the soil classifications and characteristics using the soil map tab. So across the top, there's, lot, there's maybe a little too much going on, like menu after menu. But uh, on the uh, soil map tab, we can see in this area of interest that I've specified what types of soils there are. So you can see that um, one of the largest components here is a climber de Kalb complex, very steep. And so it's not only a description of the soil type, but also the topography. So if we click on it, we'll get some of the characteristics of what is this CDF soil type. And so then here is a lot of information about the types of places that you usually see it, uh, similar soil types, uh, the, the slopes that this soil type is often found in, because you know, the slopes are sometimes related to the deposition that caused this particular soil to be in this uh, particular spot. But if we pan down through here, the thing that we're most interested in, hydrologic soil group, B. So as far as uh, West Virginia, mo more of the time we'll see class C soils. But there's a lot of information here. Um, you can see like the, the suitability for certain crops, uh, depth to the water table in areas like this. You know, and how do they know that, the depth to the water table? Well, because they know the the hydraulic conductivity of the soil. They know what kind of slopes it's usually found at. And if we look at the, the map itself, look at these, uh, let me, how do I get rid of this? All right. Look at the resolution that they're claiming. Um, can I zoom in a little more? See if it'll overlay that, yeah, okay. Do you think somebody really went out there like with a shovel and defined the boundary of this GRF soil and the GRE soil and, you know, like, was, how did they generate that? Any guess on what that comes from? It's largely based on elevation and contour lines. Uh, and if, if we pulled up a map of the contour lines, you'd see, oh, there's a lot of overlap between these contour slopes and the soil slopes. And so what they're doing is they're mostly extrapolating. They'll go to a few dozen spots that, after a geospatial analysis, they say, all right, well, we've got these locations that are like relatively shallow slope, and they're by a creek. So they'll go by a creek and a relatively shallow slope, and they go to six or seven spots, and they find all these places we're going to have the same kind of silty soil. So what we're going to do is, within a 20-mile radius, everywhere that has that same creek adjacency and relatively shallow slope, maybe like a 1% slope, we're going to say, oh, that's a floodplain, and it has the same kind of silt that deposition that we saw in those six spots that we did check on. And so now they've, boom, they've extrapolated. But then that's maybe only 2 or 3% of the land area. So then they have to fill in the gaps. They, they visit all of these different regions that have you know, a certain elevation, uh, distance away from a creek. Um, they may have rock uh, maps, and so it's adjacency to rocks, adjacency to streams, slope, 
vegetative cover. And that's another big clue, is the type of trees that are growing give you a pretty good indication of the soil characteristics. Because certain trees can only grow in well-drained soils. Certain trees can manage in a clay soil. So it's kind of uh, not just direct observation and lab testing of the soil characteristics, but it's a lot of extrapolation. And so although we have a high resolution of differentiating uh, you know, how much of the area in this relatively small watershed, you know, I didn't define an enormous area. It's a couple thousand acres, but um, look at all the different soil types. And that's another one that's relatively abundant. Uh, let's pick this. Which one did we look at? Very steep before? Let's look at the moderately steep and see if it has any difference in soil characteristics. The hydrologic soil group is the one that we're most interested in. So it's again, it's class B. The typical profile, they tell you at the certain depths what you're seeing. So you're seeing in the first inch, highly composed plant material, uh, decomposed, then loam, then channery clay loam. No. Yes? Mm -hmm. And if you go to the very bottom, it separates decap from climber and has a different uh, hydrologic soil group. Mm. You mean in this description? Yeah. yeah. You've got A for the one below it, but for the climber, it's uh, class B. Mm. So, so it's a mix of the two. So in the NRCS method, would you, which one would you take? This one. The first one. Yeah. And the good news is, is when you're actually doing the work, uh, WMS is going to do all this for you. Because you're going to have, in, in a watershed, if we zoom back out again, you're going to have thousands of areas of interest that you, you know, like thousands of these little polygons. You're not going to be able to click and check. And you, you're not, you're not going to have to do the, the calculations yourself for which soil group do I have, and go to a table and look up, all right, now what's the land use? And by the way, that's something we haven't even talked about yet, is the database of land use. This so far is only soil type. And remember, curve number is a combination of both the four soil type classifications, but then also what's on top of that soil. You know, have you got roof area on top of that soil, or is it uh, leaf litter, or is it uh, good lawns, or, or whatever? OK, so another thing I wanted to show you is that under the Soil Data Explorer, we can find like what the soil is suitable for, some more information about the soil properties and qualities. And uh, again, we can see the hydrologic soil group. So Soil Data Explorer here. Then there are all of these characteristics where you could look at you know, the relevance of this soil as it relates to the productivity of certain vegetative things. And so you know, how productive might a crop be in the area of interest? And you can get a description of all those data fields. Um, for us, though, what we are most interested in, uh, let's see, is it under land classification? Well, that's the note I left for myself. Soil properties and qualities. Now, I only look at this once a year because it's all automated. Oh, soil properties and qualities. Yeah. Have you just run it from an internship? It's like information overload. Yeah. There's lots of stuff here, for sure. Hydrologic soil group. So if we want to have a map and a table of hydrologic soil group, let's, uh, let's see, what do we do here? View description. And then it'll tell us about A, B, C, D. And for our area of interest, now it's breaking that up into what percent of our watershed is each classification. And so now we can see uh, there's a handful of bees 
Here's even uh, 1.6 of the watershed is this soil class A, but we do see some B class soils and a lot of C class soils. Like if you add up the area, a big share of it is going to be C class soils. And so here's a, a map of it. And we could download this map if we wanted to or create a report, you know, print it out. View rating. And uh, if we click on a certain area, so let's zoom in right over here by the airport. Zoom in by the airport. If, if we want to know a particular spot, you know, let's say, oh, where was that big slump? It was to the uh, south of the runway. Was it, which runway was it? Does anybody remember? Was it this one or was it this one? I think it was the long one. That's why they have the, uh, the emergency system. So I think the slip was over here, right? So if we wanted to know a little bit more about the soil type right where that slip happened, ah, we see it now, right? Isn't this where it happened? It's all messed up right over here. So uh, we can click on this I, and it'll identify the characteristics for, I think, where we click. And so it brings up a warning. Soil ratings map may not be valid at this scale. It's saying it's pretty good on a wide-ranging basis where you're doing an averages. But so where I just clicked, now it's telling me that is soil group C. It's this Gilpin silt loam. Yeah. Soil, soil slippage potential. Let's see what it predicts about that. That's not something that I've seen before, but they are saying, oh, we've got a little bit of risk down here. All right, so um, you can download the soil data if you need to. And um, there's two, broadly speaking, two different resolutions of soil data, SIRGO and STATSGO. STATSGO is a low resolution data set. And and I mean, like, your entire county may only be broken into two different, three different soil types. It's really low resolution. But Sergo, what we've just been looking at, is a much higher resolution where they're trying to break up, you know, on an acre by acre basis, what kind of soil uh, you've got. Uh, and so now that I've got this area of interest defined, um, create a download link. So I've got my area of interest, and it's going to give me an Esri shape file with the Sergo. So I can download that. I'm not sure. I don't recall whether this is a thing where you have to put in your email address and wait. Apparently not, because it's ready. So if I download that, and I'm just going to save it to a location that I can come back to later. I'll put it in C temp and then open and unzip that. And let's see if we can open it up in Google Earth. All right. Spatial. And uh, there's several different shape files here. They probably have different characteristics. Um, we'd need to go into one of these text documents, and it would tell us probably all of the different, you know, what's the P, the L. Well, let's just open one of them for kicks. Import. The big one. When in doubt, choose the big one. Okay, so we're over by the airport now, and I'll turn it on. Hey, there's our soil data. It's pretty. All right. It would be more meaningful if we opened it up in uh, WMS. We can visualize it in um, here in Google Earth Pro, but I'm not sure if we'd be able to to identify like what are the characteristics by clicking on a oh no we can we can click on a spot and it'll tell us uh, GRF so we could look that up U sub F that's the upshore 
So yeah, by clicking on each location, you can find out what's the soil type in a certain spot. All right, so that's soil type. Now, the other factor that determines curve number is land use. And you can download the land use for the entire United States. It's about a, gig a gigabyte. So you wouldn't want to do it on your phone if you've got like limited data. Uh, it's about 1.1 gig gigabyte for the entire country. Let me just show you where that website is. Hopefully it's loading. Unfortunately, the latest version of this National Land Cover Database, as it's known, NLCD, National Land Cover Database, the most recent, recent version of the product is uh, 2011. They have been updating it about every five years before that, um, but I'm still holding my breath on when the update's going to be. It's kind of interesting because you can go back over time and see how has the land cover changed. And so if you're interested in a certain watershed, remember we've had a, a couple of questions this semester of before development and after development. Well, you could very easily analyze what was going on in the watershed back in 2006 by getting the pre. And so, um, you know, that area here in Huntington, out where the Amazon is, I forget what the name of that is. It's real weird, that, that road. Kinetic Park, yeah. So that, what does that even mean? Uh, all that parking lot and the buildings they put up there, that increased the runoff someplace. How much did it increase the runoff? Well, what you could do is you could analyze the watershed using this 2001 um, land cover and then the updated land cover after it was constructed. I don't know it, if it was constructed by 2011. It might have been. But um, let's actually download some of that data with the National Map Viewer. Um, so the National Map Viewer is kind of a way, is a place where a lot of GIS data is aggregated. So if you just Google search National Map Viewer, I think it might come up. Otherwise, it's viewer.nationalmap.gov slash basic. And uh, as you zoom in on an area that you are working in, you can pan and um, it has all these different products, and you can get the elevation products like, remember I was telling you what a digital elevation model is, a DEM. That is the, uh, the mesh that at every location on a cell-by-cell -cell basis it's telling you the elevation there. But what we are interested in is the National Land Cover Database. And so now that we're zoomed in on a certain area, what it'll tell you is what information it has for the area that you're zoomed in on. And so if I click National Land Cover Database, it's going to tell me all of the data that's available in this spot. So I could get the 2001, 2006, or the 2011. And uh, it'll get it you, for you on a 3 by 3 degree basis. And so down here at the bottom, it's giving you latitude and longitude. And so 3 degrees is quite a lot. And that's a lot more than we'd want. Uh, of course. Everything's going to be more than we want. There used to be a way of kind of specifying your area of interest and only downloading that. They've updated the, the site a couple of times since I knew how to do that. It, maybe it's still possible. But instead, what I'll do is I'm just going to download the entire state of West Virginia. So what this is going to have, this National Land Cover Database, is it'll define for the entire state what's the land use in every spot. Yeah. It might be a uh, like Mm-hmm. Let's give it a shot. No, it won't even let me do it. Can you believe that? Yeah. That would be the logical approach. And well, let's see, what is this? Draw. All right, let's draw. Let's see, the download. Once we tell it what we want, um, well, I'll figure this out someday. Until then, I'm just going to download the whole state. So find products, and then it tells you, let's see what we've got. We've got the 2011 land cover, and that's, that's what we want. But it also breaks out 
a separate map where it's just the tree canopy data. Kind of interesting because rather than being what's on the surface, it's looking more about what's above the surface. So if we're particularly interested in interception, we might utilize that tree canopy database. Percent developed impervious, that would be pretty useful if we were only wanting to distinguish between developed areas and the raw land. And then it has all the historical data as well. Um, but let's just uh, download the extent state. Yeah, I used to be able to do extent and just sort of like what you were drawing. Maybe, nah, I'm not going to bother with it. Let's get that whole state. It's only 28 megabytes until we unzip it. So download, and uh, we'll save as, put it here in my temp directory, because when I unzip it, I want to be able to know where it is. Um, the main thing that's in there is a, uh, it's a raster file. It's a TIFF that right now is pretty small. If you look, that this is 29 megabytes. But then when I extract it, unzip that archive, there's going to be a few files. But the biggest among them is that TIFF. And now it's expanded out to 173 megabytes. And a TIFF is just an image file. And we could open this like with paint or something. It might crash because 173 megabytes is a pretty big image. But let's just double click and see what happens, like what kind of viewer it wants to open that with, like the default Windows picture viewer. And so it's a picture of the state. Each one of those colors means a different land use. And there's a, a table of contents, like a key, where we can look up the difference in land use between um, uh, forested with deciduous trees, forested with evergreen trees. Um, what would you guess red means? Yeah, it's developed areas. Um, I think blue is rivers. Well, let's zoom in a little bit and see if we can get a closer look. So there's a lot of resolution there. Um, and if you kind of know what you're looking for as far as the patterns go, you can start to recognize areas. We pan over here. OK, so here's Huntington, right? You can see the outline of the city. I guess, is this the mall? Yeah, and this is uh, the Kanawha River. Oh, here's Charleston. OK, so this is Charleston. So. I don't think this is the mall necessarily. Um, but you get the idea that uh, if you've got this image, if you zoom in enough, you can start to see the pixels. And that's what a raster file is. This is different from a vector file. Like that soil data that we had, that shape file, you can keep zooming in and zooming in, and it's not going to get pixelated, because a vector file defines an exact boundary. Whereas here, what we're saying is, is that each one of these pixels maybe represents 30 meters by 30 meters. And what they did is they said everywhere in this 30 meter area is going to be assigned the same kind of land use. And it's a color right now, but there is an accompanying data file that defines what colors correspond to which land uses. And WMS, the program we're going to use to automatically calculate our curve numbers for us, it knows how to interpret those colors because we give it a key. Uh, a couple of years ago, I went and I translated what are the land uses to like a, a curve number table that I had some confidence in. And so by land use and soil type, it's able to automatically calculate for every, you know, remember that fine, like how fine the, uh, the soil type curves were. Like for a certain area, there were thousands of them. And so on top of that, is a really complicated uh, view of the land use. And so what WMS, this program we're going to start learning, does is it takes an average of all of these different land uses, and it, it comes up with a weighted curve number for each, uh, each area based on the soil polygons and what land use is inside of those soil polygons. So you have an idea of what it is. And if we want, if we're feeling crazy, we can open up that. Um, the TIFF. 
and it's called a geotiff. See how it, it's saying geotiff? Um, the, it's just a, a picture when we're looking at it here. And this Windows Photo Viewer, it doesn't know latitude and longitude. You know, like down at the bottom of the screen, when I move the cursor back and forth, it doesn't know where these are. It's just displaying the pixels in the order that it's supposed to. But a geotiff, it takes and it ties this image into known latitude and longitude so, um, so that when I open it in Google Earth, the extents of this image are right on top of where Google Earth Pro knows West Virginia is supposed to be. And what it's saying is, wow, this is a big image file. We can't display it all at once because you don't have enough memory. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it to crop. And so I'll just crop you know, like what area I'm interested in. If I choose uh, the Charleston area, then it's going to display as much as it reasonably can with the memory that it's got available around the Yeager Airport. So I can zoom in and see those same colors that I was looking at before. And maybe I'll turn off my primary base layers and only look at that image. A little blurry. It may need to like refresh the image at different uh, elevations. Maybe we can change the opacity to see like what's behind it. And it matches up, right? That geo-reference stuff, that's not kidding. It puts the roads on top of the roads, it puts the water on top of the water, and that's maybe a, another way to identify like what color means what thing. Okay, blue means water, and it seems like it means water whether it's a river or a tailing pond. Red means developed areas, green means raw land, so I can do that all day, but I'm not going to. Any questions about the National Land Cover Database? All right, so the NRCS method, the NRCS, before it was called NRCS, it was called the Soil Conservation Service. So that's what SCS stands for. SCS stands for Soil Conservation Service. And unfortunately, <laughs> from book to book, they kind of use those two terms interchangeably. So this SCS unit hydrograph method is also called the NRCS unit hydrograph method. And this is one of the ways that you can turn the amount into the timing. Remember, the NRCS method just said of the x inches of rainfall, how many inches of rainfall excess will you have? What this does is it tells you when that flow is actually going to occur. And uh, there are two main factors. There are There is the, the lag time, which is from the middle of the rainfall to the peak, and then we have to also specify the duration of the rainfall, P sub R. And once you calculate the lag time, then this runoff is normalized. So on the vertical axis, you can see it's the Q relative to Q sub P. And so this is the, essentially the fraction of the rainfall relative to the peak runoff. Uh, the, that's this curve. The other curve is the overall percentage of runoff up to a certain point. And that's why it starts at zero and it's increasing up till it gets to 100%. So uh, this is also provided in tabular form. It's not just graphic. You can go, for instance, where is it? This data is available in your book. And so it says that some time relative to the peak time, you have a certain amount of discharge relative to the peak discharge. So if you go through their method and you determine that you're going to see the peak after two hours, then what that would mean is that if the peak flow is at two hours, then at one hour, so 0.5 of the peak, at one hour you're going to have 47% of the peak flow. And at, uh, so if one, 0.0 was two hours, then at four hours after the storm event begins, then you're going to see 28% of the peak flow. So this discharge ratio uh, is in your book, and it's also built into a, a lot of computer programs. And so uh, we start with having this general shape. This is kind of like a unit hydrograph in a way. 
Remember that a unit hydrograph was a generalized shape of, of runoff for a certain watershed. This is a shape of runoff just in general. Like if you don't have any specific information about the watershed, then what we're going to do is we're going to kind of say, how big is that peak and how soon does it come? But then the generalized shape is going to be used for any area. Here is the uh, method for calculating the time of concentration. So you, if we, what we want is the lag time, then the, uh, the way to calculate the lag time is something known as the hydraulic length, and that is the, uh, the distance that the particle is traveling inside the watershed from the furthest most point to the, the point of concentration to the outlet of the watershed. Now S you know that that comes from the curve number. And then y is the slope as a whole number percentage. So if your watershed is 3%, then you'd put 3 in there, if that's the average slope of the watershed. Um, so this is a way of, of estimating the lag time. And uh, it's in hours. We'll get some practice using that with an example here in just a second. Um, but one of the reasons why we have such uh, troublesome flooding in West Virginia is because we have really steep slopes. So, I mean, there are watersheds common. They're all over the state where the slope is 45, 50 percent. And so what that does is if you have a really big denominator, then the, the term, the lag time, is really small. So you have a very short time from when it rains to when the peak occurs if you've got a steep slope. But then think about what are the factors that can make a longer lag time. So what's in the numerator? So L. If you have a big watershed, then the, then the water has to travel further until it all con congregates together at the outlet. And then the other factor is that the more storage you have, the longer time it'll take. And so it's kind of accounting for the factor that we know that if you have uh, smooth surfaces and the urbanization effect, that it brings the peak sooner than the, uh, the lag time formula here, this SCS lag time formula, does take that into account. Uh, the condition of the surface, the size of the watershed, and then how steep it is. Yeah, it is. Just traditional units. Uh, I would imagine that there's a, a version of it with SI units, but curve numbers are inherently in traditional units. Uh, I love SI, but I've never worked these calculations in anything other than traditional units. All right. Um, now, there have been some correction factors that have been made over time to try and adjust even beyond what's built into this SCS uh, method for calculating the time of concentration. Um, Here's a table that's found in the book that suggests that for urban areas, then you could uh, peak it a bit more than the typical SCS peaking factor that's built into that curve that I've already shown you. And then in very flat rural areas, then you might bring the, the factor down a bit. Um, so what this is doing is it's saying uh, for a unit hydrograph, what the peak discharge is going to be as a function of the time to peak. And uh, the time of concentration, the lag time, and time to peak are all interrelated. Um, if the lag time, look on this graph, the lag time is from the middle of the storm, so the middle of the hydrograph, you know, this center of, uh, center of area for the storm, lag time goes from that to the peak. Uh, the time of concentration is going from the end of the storm to the point of inflection where now the drainage is slowing, where uh, your, your flow rate at the outlet is decreasing over time, and so is the rate of decrease. So that's the point of inflection. So the, the time of concentration is just five, is generally accepted to be five thirds the, uh, the lag time. And uh, so here, once you know the time of concentration, then you can calculate the time to peak as two-thirds of that. Um, so let's just put some of these numbers to the test here. Let's find out the uh, unit 
hydrograph peak discharge if we know that it's a three mile watershed, a curve number of 86, and we're going to use that curve number of 86 to uh, calculate, of course, the storage. And we want to find out at its highest how much flow are we likely to see from this watershed. In the example, since it's saying find the unit uh, hydrograph peak discharge, then that means in this formula, Q is going to be one inch of rainfall excess. Um, so I know that the units aren't on this particular slide, but the area for the formula in step three, the area is three miles, and you put that in as three. But then Q, we're talking about one inch of rainfall excess. We want to find out how many CFS is coming out of this watershed for each inch of rainfall excess. First of all, the S, we can calculate the, the storage for this watershed. It's, let's see, 1,000 divided by 86 minus 10. So the storage is um, 1.63. Anybody else get that same 1.63 inches? Yeah, OK. So that's what goes into S, Y is 3, and then L is we need to convert 1.2 miles into feet. So 5280 times 1 mile. So 6336 feet to the 8 pow 0.8 power, 1.63 plus 1 to the 0.7 power, and then 1900 times Y, our slope is 3% to the 1 half power. So the lag time is 0.6 five, six hours, and the time of concentration then will be 1.093 hours. And finally from that we can get the time to peak, 0.729 hours. Let's go back to the figure. So the time to peak is from zero to where we have the highest flow rate. Um, the other things we're measuring from different spots. Uh, for example, the lag time is from the middle point of the rainfall duration to the peak. The uh, uh, time of concentration is from the end of rainfall to the point of inflection. But T sub P is from the zero, which is when the storm event actually begins. So 0.729 hours for the time to peak. And then this flow, the, the runoff per unit rainfall excess. So we're assuming it's a kind of a typical watershed. So that's why we're using this 484. If we're giving something in the problem statement that allows us to differentiate, to use a different peaking factor in this formula, this is going to tell us the peak discharge from the uh, from the watershed, and it is, <coughs> excuse me, it's going to be in units of depth. It's lowercase q sub p, and uh, so 484. Since 
We have no other specific information about the nature of the watershed, three square miles, one inch of rainfall excess, and then the time to peak in the denominator there. So it should be 1992 CFS per inch of rainfall excess. I should really write that in the example. It's inch of rainfall excess. It's not inch of, of rainfall. And so what we would use this for is, remember, we already have a different formula that tells us how to estimate how many inches of rainfall excess we're going to get. The NRCS method that you've seen before um, tells you if you have a certain amount of precipitation, how much precipitation excess is there. And then you take this, and it'll tell you for a certain number of inches of precipitation excess, how many CFS of rainfall do you get based on the area of the watershed and all of the other factors that we've discussed. So then the only thing that we've defined, though, is the size of that peak. So if we go back to the graph, we say we've told ourselves how tall, how tall this is going to be, but then what about timing? Like what CFS is it going to be at every time? And that is where we could use this data. So part of the example I'm saying, what is the flow rate at a time of 87 minutes? So if I started up Excel, I could paste this data into Excel, this discharge ratio, and create a hydrograph with a pretty nice shape. So I'm just going to paste this in to illustrate uh, how it's used and what it's for. Okay, so this is the time ratio and the discharge ratio. And what we found in our calculations was that the T to P, the time to peak is um, 0.729 hours. And just to make sure I'm going to specify that that's hours. And then the, uh, the discharge, the uh, Q sub P, in terms of CFS per inch of rainfall excess that we calculated was 1992 CFS per. All right, so then this is time in hours, and what we get from it is a discharge in CFS. So the time is going to be this time ratio, T to T sub P multiplied by the time to peak. And that's, I'm going to fix that with the uh, anchoring. So then this is how many hours, and I can drag all the way down through. And this is going to be the discharge at each one of these times. And I guess, of course, it starts at zero. So there's zero time, zero flow rate. So here we see this is the peak discharge. It occurs at 0.729 hours. Uh, this example was asking, what's the flow rate at 87 minutes? So I guess I maybe need to create a, a time column in minutes as well. So time in minutes is simply going to be the time in hours multiplied by 60. So that times 60. So at 87 minutes, there it is, it's 558 CFS. And so we could create a graph of this, and it's going to turn out pretty good. Um, well, I'll select the data to add for the x-axis. It's going to be time. Let's do it in hours. And on the y-axis, it's discharge. Does anybody else smell that kind of like natural gas smell? Yeah, I'm not loving it. Every time this happens, it happens regularly because it's steel of West Virginia. They're cleaning out some storage tanks. The safety department always sends an email, hey, nobody worry. It's just hydrogen sulfide. Don't worry. Yeah. Uh, well, the thing about it is, guys, uh, because they're, they're saying, don't worry, it's not going to explode. You know, it's not natural gas. It's not going to explode, but it will uh, cause cancer and respiratory issues and asthma and all that stuff. So, anyway. All right, so we have a hydrograph. And what did we start with to get that hydrograph? Uh, a curve number, 
a watershed area, a slope, and the length of the, the particle, like the longest length in the watershed that the water is traveling to get from the edge of the watershed to the outlet. So just a few distance parameters, some combined effect of land use and soil type, and then this generalized curve of what the shape usually looks like. Now, does it always look like that? Of course not. And is it accurate that there's just going to be a certain pulse of rainfall? And how often do you see a storm that looks like this? Uh, how often do you see a storm where it goes from zero rainfall suddenly to its intensity, and it stays that same intensity, and then it stops? It's never like just that. But what you can do is you can break, uh, break your rainfall event like if it rained, if, if what really happened was that, first of all, if our hydrograph, hydrograph uh, pointing downward, it's a little bit of rain, and then we got a lot of rain, and then it's super a lot of rain, and then it was small again. You already have experience piling hydrographs on top of each other and delaying it by a certain time period. So we could take this approach and we could say, well, our storm, and this is rainfall excess, we, we know the response to this amount of precipitation, and then we can you know, create a column of our hydrograph with that data. And then we're going to treat this next hour of rainfall like a, another pulse of uh, rainfall excess. And, uh, and then we'll combine all the hydrographs in the end. Now, we have to make maybe over time some corrections because you know, that first pulse of rainfall, maybe your antecedent moisture condition is different from the second one. But we can do all of that. We can account for those factors um, and uh, get a pretty accurate result, where if you actually measure the flow downstream, the predicted hydrograph using this NRCS approach and the SCS method for the unit hydrograph, it, it can be quite accurate at times. Um, I multiplied this known discharge of 1992 from this formula. I multiplied it by the fractional data. So this, this second column says the discharge ratio. So it's saying basically what's the flow rate at any given time relative to the peak flow rate. And so I multiplied 1992 by every cell in that column. And that'll give me the cubic feet per second corresponding to the time relative to the peak time. So this is all kind of units. Uh, the, the time has been normalized and the amount has been normalized. And so what we do is we, we multiply this column by the time to peak and this column by the runoff per uh, the runoff depth because it doesn't always have to be on a per inch of rainfall excess. You could have, we could have worked this example for three inches of rainfall excess. It didn't have to necessarily be for just a unit of rainfall excess. Yeah. OK, any questions? So. What I did a couple of years ago when I was living in the UAE is I wanted to test how good is the NRCS method in an arid environment that's really steep watersheds. Here in West Virginia, we have a, uh, a very wet environment and steep watersheds. And sometimes the best way to understand things is by studying the extremes. And so here in West Virginia, we have an extreme environment. It's extremely vegetated, and it's extremely steep. Um, so what I wanted to do is compare and contrast, because by going to another area where they have similar slopes but no vegetation, what it allows you to do is find out of our lag time and time of concentration, what effect is the vegetation having on uh, how quickly the watershed moves through the uh, uh, the, how quickly the water moves through the watershed. We don't have time for this entire presentation. You've seen some of it anyway. You already know that typical shape and the lag time calculation. But what I did when I was on sabbatical was I compared and contrasted. This is a picture of a watershed in West Virginia. 
And this is a picture that I took of a watershed over in the UAE. Um, you can see there is some vegetation, but uh, you're not going to have a lot of interception. And so the, the storms are quite flashy because it's steep and uh, the soil quickly gets overwhelmed. Um, let me just get right into telling you about there is a dam out there. And uh, in the dry months, there's no water. In the wet months, there's plenty of water. And so I went out to this watershed. And uh, I put in um, a rain gauge. That's this, a rain gauge, and also a pressure sensor. And the pressure sensor, when I put it in a tube, a metal tube, it allowed me to know what the depth of water was that's going through there. And if I know the water depth, then I can monitor how long from when the storm starts until that peak flow arrives. Because why, what I wanted to do, the main thing was to see how accurately is this lag time formula uh, estimating how long it takes until the, uh, the rainfall arrives. I was a little worried leaving all this equipment out there. I didn't know if like a camel was going to stomp on it or, <laughs> you know, but nothing ever got disturbed. It was perfectly fine. What I, another worry that I had besides camel stomping on my equipment is it might not rain. You know, there, there are years where it just doesn't rain over there, but uh, it was one of the wettest years on record. I got really lucky. And I had plenty of storms that I could analyze the data for. I had um, a few storms where the, uh, the stream gauge sensor could only run for about two weeks at a time before its memory was full. So I had to go out there every couple of weeks and download the data. Um, so a few of the nice storms, I wasn't able to match up the storm and the runoff data because the stream gauge had messed up. But I did have four of them where I had a good intensity, uh, I measured the storm data, like the, the, the temporal resolution of my storm intensity is pretty good with this tipping gauge, rain gauge. You can see that, you know, 15 minutes, and I have a pretty good idea of when that rainfall actually occurred, even though it's a short, a short time scale. And so there was runoff, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to estimate how long was it, physically estimate, how long was it from midpoint of the rainfall till the peak of discharge, because that's what that, uh, that lag time calculation measures. It's the middle of the rainfall to when the peak is observed. I wanted to see how accurately does the SCS method uh, do that. And uh, the answer is not super accurately. Um, if you uh, do a physical measurement of what's going on in the watershed over a couple of different storm events, that's what I did for both a large watershed and a small watershed. So I plugged in all of the data to the, uh, to the SCS equation, you know, the land use, the uh, soil type. I put in the information about the watershed slope, the distances, all the input data. Uh, it predicted for this wa large watershed, you should see about 29 minutes of lag time and 12 minutes for the small watershed. But actually, it was only about a third. And it's pretty consistent, 29 and 9, about a third of the uh, lag time compared to what's predicted. And so this SCS method wasn't developed with really steep watersheds in mind. Um, it was calibrated over watersheds maybe up to 8 or 10% slope. Uh, but when you get into the 30s, 40s, and even 50% watershed slope, then the water is moving a lot more quickly than that SCS method is calibrated to predict. So what I was able to do then is develop kind of a localized model for predicting the lag time. And so that's significant because they do have culverts over there. They have channels over there. They have the infrastructure in place to convey stormwater flows. Um, and so it needs to be sized with uh, the correct timing of the water in mind. So. It was kind of uh, an interesting project. And uh, oh, here's, here's a, a look at you know, some of the, the infrastructure that gets sized based on bad estimates. If they know that those are bad estimates, they may say, well, we know that the SCS method isn't giving us a good time of concentration, so let's just double how big it needs to be, you know, or let's just triple it to be conservative. But if you have a more accurate representation of what's really going on, then you can 
with more confidence, engineer your structures kind of closer to the line and save some money. Because that, you know, engineers are trying to be efficient. You want to make the, uh, the best possible design that just barely satisfies the requirements. You don't want to just blow it out of the water with a super conservative design. So this isn't all just theoretical. You know, these, these empirical equations can be tested. And sometimes they hold up. Other times they don't. Uh, but anyways, let's just uh, take one last look at these announcements. The homework assignment, unit hydrograph, and time of concentration. It's kind of all touching on this stuff that we've discussed in class today. That'll be due a week from today, next Tuesday. So have a good day.